Hello again, everyone. In this lesson, you're going to learn the fundamentals of how attribute tables work in GIS data sets. We'll also add a new attribute to our attribute table, and then we'll set new values for that new attribute. Attributes are something that we've kind of hinted at and shown you in the periphery here, but that we haven't really explained in much detail. So this is the lecture where you learn about them in much more detail so that you can use them. So we're going to be focusing primarily on the rivers layer in this lecture. So I'm going to fade out the background information, the watersheds here, so that we can really see the rivers and the watersheds will still be there to provide some context. I'll do that in kind of a simple way. I'm going to open up the properties pane in the watersheds and I'll go to the display tab here and under transparency, I'll set it to about 80% transparent so that the white background of the data frame shines through and I'll click okay. And you can still see them in the background there barely, but we can see our foreground data much better. And now I'll change our rivers layer back so that it's blue again and makes a little more sense to us. Okay. So let's zoom in on a small area here just to make it easier to see what we're doing with our attribute table. And I'll start by selecting a few features here. And then we'll right click on our rivers layer, just, just to make this easy. We don't have to do this, but just to make this easy. We'll right click, we'll go to selection and we'll create a layer from the selected features. And that gives us a whole separate layer here. And if I clear the selection, we can, you, maybe you can barely see that there's a slightly different color to these that's assigned here. I'll make them kind of a thick black here so we can really see them. So we have a new layer from our rivers. And if I open the attribute table, I just have four records here. So let's move it to one side and we'll drag these so that we can see them all at the same time. So, so far we've in previous lectures, we've selected features from layers and looked at them in the attribute table and we've symbolized our layers based on attributes in the attribute table. And then we just subsetted our data based on the attribute table, both in this lecture and the last one. So, I want you to see that the features and the attribute table are inextricably linked, but you might still be asking, what is an attribute table? The quick answer is that it's a table, which has columns and rows of information that describes the features that we see on the map. In almost all cases for every single feature, whether it's a polygon, a line or a point, we have an attribute record. So if I make this layer, the selectable layer, and I select one of these features here, I get a selection in my attribute table, right? If I do the same thing over here, I get a different selection and a different selection and a different selection. Each feature has its own record and each record has its own feature. If I change the selection here, it also changes it on the map. ArcGIS is giving us another clue about each record or row here in the attribute table, having its own feature in this shape column or this shape field. And we can't really see what's in it, but it says polyline ZM in each of these. That's ArcGIS's way of describing in words, the general geometry of these lines for us. So they're polylines. That means that there are multiple line segments connected together. And then Z and M describe some features of those polylines saying both that they have 3d information and they also have routing information on them. The Z is for the 3d and the M is for the routing. And while it's giving us a text display of it in the attribute table, if we were to access this field in some other way, we could actually manipulate the shape information here, the feature information on the map. For those of you who've worked with databases before, that's exactly what we're dealing with here. We can query this data. For those of you who haven't, but you've maybe worked with spreadsheets, you're in really similar territory here. If you conceptualize this like a spreadsheet for now, you'll be in good shape. And for those of you who've never had any experience with attribute tables and records like this before, don't worry. What I want you to do is I want you to think of an attribute record, one of these rows that corresponds to one of these features as a list of information about that feature, almost like you'd write it down in a notebook if you were out in the world collecting information about a location. So you might be at this river segment here and you might write down, okay, the date that you're doing the surveying is, July 3rd, 1999. And then you might go on and you'd say, okay, well, the name of this river segment is some name. This one doesn't have a name right now. And then you might go on again and you'd write down something like, well, it's a feature type of, it's, it's a stream or a river. So you put stream river. 
And then when you get back into the office or when you have some technology out in the field that lets you do this, you add that information to the record here along with all the other information that's calculated by ArcGIS, such as the length of the shape. I think it helps here to take a step back and think about what a feature class is. In a general sense, the attribute table helps us define a feature class because without it, we just have a bunch of lines on the landscape here. But the attribute table helps us indicate the types of things that we need to know about one of these streams or rivers for it to be considered a stream or river in this data set. It's this collection of possible attributes here that define the data table. These are known as the schema, and those combined with the feature information are what make up a feature class. Going back to our writing it down in a notebook analogy of I have a name and a date, these help us standardize that information so that we can take all of our different notes about streams and rivers and group them together into one data set that we can analyze as a unit. So we standardize the notes we take, almost like making a form that we'd fill out. And each of the things that we take notes about becomes a column in our data table, and we call them fields as if they are form fields. One thing to note is that when we define fields, we also set a data type for that field, and that's enforced for us by ArcGIS. So if I right click on the com ID field here, go to properties, it tells me that it's of type long, and we'll go through the real data types in the next class. But for now, know that there are three basic data types. There's text or strings. There are integer data. So that's long integer or short integer. And then there are decimal numbers, sometimes called floating points or doubles. So you'll see those as floats and doubles in here. As I said, these data types are enforced. So I can't put a decimal number or text in this field because it's a type long integer. And as we can see, the COM ID field only has integers in it. Some of you might be getting ahead of me and thinking, well, for text fields, sometimes numbers are part of text. So if it's enforcing it as only text, what do I do? Well, that's okay. When you include numbers in a text field, that's fine. It just becomes a part of the text, but you can't really analyze them as numbers in a structured way in that case. When you want to analyze your numbers in a structured way, you need a number field, either an integer or a decimal number field. So let's close this out. And what I want to do now is show you how to add new fields to your data sets and then how to fill them in really in a basic manner. We can do that up here in the table menu. And if I click the down arrow, I get add field. And it asks for a name, a data type, and some other basic parameters. So we'll give this name a uh, classification because what we're going to do is we're going to take these rivers and just segment them into two groups. And in a lot of cases, I do this as an integer where the classification might be like zero, one, or two, but let's do it as text in this case. And it asks us for a length and we'll just set it, we're gonna make it really short. So we'll set it as 10 and that'll use less storage space on our hard drive. And I click okay. And if I scroll all the way to the right, I see classification field with this null value. Null is kind of special, just like the shape field, because it says null between those angle brackets, but there's actually no value in that field at all. Null is just what it tells us when there's no value whatsoever. The word null is not written into that field. There's a special value stored there to indicate that the value is null or not populated. So first let's remove the selection on this layer so that none of our rivers are selected because something special happens that I'll show you in a moment when we have a selection active. And let's right click on the classification field we just created and go to field calculator. And there's kind of a lot going on here, but let's start actually down at the bottom here where it says classification equals. So it's gonna evaluate what we put in this box for every single row and put the resulting value in the classification field for us. I could do math on other fields in the same record here. I could add uh, the com ID field and subtract another field or something if I wanted to, which would be nonsensical for this data set, but just as an example. And I can also run some other functions here. In this case, let's do something called the Strahler stream order. And the Strahler stream order is this classification system for rivers where all the kind of uh, top rivers in a watershed here are stream order one. And what that means is they don't have any rivers flowing into them. But when two order one rivers flow together, as they do right here, we get a stream order two river. 
And if another order one river flows into that stream order two river, it's still a stream order two river. It doesn't grow again until it encounters another stream order two river, and then they join together and become a stream order three river and so on. So if I want to manually add this information to my data set, I can default them all to stream order one for now. So I'll just right click classification equals, and since it's text, I'm going to put it in quotes and I'll put order one and click OK. And I can see that my attribute table right here updates and they all say order one. And I can even verify that if I identify a feature here, the identify pane pops out, Oop. identify pane pops out over here and classification says order one now. So it updates across anywhere that the attribute table is used. So I'll move this back over again. And but what we know is wrong is that one of these isn't a stream order one river. It's a stream order two, as we just talked about. These two stream order one rivers flow together to be a stream order two river here. So I'm going to select this river, just that segment there, and we're going to update it. One really cool thing about selections that you'll learn in more detail in the next lecture is that when you have a record selected, most operations you do only operate on the selected feature. So it allows you to really interact with your data and use this combination of automated processes and manual processes to get your data to the, what you need it to be. So if I right click on classification again and go to field calculator, I can just change it so that it says classification is order two here. And I click OK and only that record updates. All of the others are order one and that one's order two. Now, just to bring it together along with the last lecture, I could open up the rivers layer now. And if I go to symbology, I can go to categories here since they're not numerical data. And I can now select my classification field, and click add all values. And I might wanna make order one rivers a little thin and then order two rivers, I'll make a little thicker to reflect that they have a little more water in them usually. So I'll right click and do properties for selected symbols and I'll just bump it up and make it also blue there still. So if I click okay and then I deselect, we see that I have my river here and then a little thicker line only on the order two river. I should note that for this small of a manipulation, there's a better way to edit your data and that's using the feature creation and editing tools, but that's a whole discussion in itself. And you're going to learn that later in this class, but for now the field calculator can get by, by adding and manipulating attributes by using selections. Okay. That's it for this lesson. In this lesson, you learned what an attribute table is, why it's so important and how those attributes relate to features. You also learned how to modify the attribute table and add your own attributes, and then how to change and populate those values in one of the ways ArcGIS makes available to you. I hope you feel like you have a better understanding of this information now. If you don't, or even if you do, I suggest heading on over to the forum of the class and starting a discussion or participating in an existing one about feature classes and attributes, because these are a really core part of your GIS experience. And it's great if you understand how to use them, some tips and tricks and what's going on with them. In the next lecture, we're going to continue on with the map document we have here and with a little bit of what you've been doing. And I'm going to teach you a lot more about selections and using them to refine your data and explore it. I really like selections a lot. They're one of my favorite parts about GIS because they really let you ask the question of where are things that are important to me. So I think we'll have a lot of fun and I will see you there.